Maria trained as a physicist and uh, Maria is a very um, good example of a physicist doing interdisciplinary work very well. Um, she has lots of very successful projects with, um, with economists and um, Maria recently finished her PhD in um, Doin Farmer's group at the University of Oxford and uh, I, be I believe um, you've just uh, begun a McDonald Fellowship, is that, is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, with some delays. I'm starting in April due to, uh, well, COVID delays, but yes, that's, that's right. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, <laughs> due to uh, 2020, that's all. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and, uh, so her research has included uh, some work on, great work on automation, which we're going to hear about today, um, and also um, also looking at the effects of uh, COVID-19 and uh, working from home um, and a sort of jobs perspective on, on that. And I would encourage all of you to um, look up that, that paper as well. Uh, so I will give the floor to you, Maria. Great. Uh, thanks so much for the very kind introduction, Alex, and for the uh, it's It's been a while since I've been following uh, the research at uh, the Center for Humans and Machines in uh, the Max Planck Institute. So well, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, as Alex said, today I'm going to talk about occupational mobility and automation, a data-driven network model. And towards the end, I'll talk a bit more about how we can uh, also use this to understand the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'd like to start this talk always by asking, you know, uh, how, to, how, how would you choose the right career, right? So assume a high school student asks you for career advice. They say they either want to become a statistical assistant or an electrician. Now you do your research and you find out that uh, statistical assistants are likely to be automated. That's you know replaced by either some software or robots, uh, while electricians are not. Uh, so based on this information, you might be thinking, well, uh, you should become an electrician. That way you don't have to worry about uh, automation. Well, uh, this research is about why that would be the wrong answer. And it would be the wrong answer because we will be focusing on just single numbers instead of acknowledging the complexity of the problem. And we believe the problem looks more like this. So this is uh, the occupational mobility network. Dots are occupations and edges denote job transitions. And we have uh, color-coded occupations by their automation mobility. So we see, for example, statistical assistants are, sorry, oops, sorry, are uh, unlikely to be automated. They're colored blue, but uh, they're surrounded by red occupations meaning that, you know, as this worker starts being displaced by automation, they might be able to transition into electrician jobs. Uh, the same thing we have for childcare workers, right? They're blue, but in a sense, childcare is a bit natural to, to many people, and it's something uh, you can transition into. Statistical assistants and pharmacy ADs, on the other hand, they're, unlike, they're likely to be automated, so they might be, in that sense, displaced by some software robots. But if that were to happen, maybe they can transition into other blue occupations, which you know, might be growing in demand. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the estimates we use are uh, from Frey and Osborne. Uh, okay, so now before, you know, let's, before we dive in, in, in into the model and everything, let's talk a bit about automation. And the thing is, automation is not new. It's something that has happened before. We usually talk about it as structural change, right? So, you know, we're, we're thinking that uh, some centuries ago, we were, you know, 80% of the labor force was in agriculture. Uh, then we switched to industry in, in the Industrial Revolution, and now 80% of the labor force focuses on services. So this is just some data to highlight this, and we have the drop in agriculture, a bit of the rise in manufacturers and fall as well, and how services and, and other occupations have been rising. So in a sense, what happens is like when, when automation, you know, automates agriculture or manufacturing, then we're able to have um, increase in demand for other services. And, and that's the thing, automation also creates jobs, right? It's, it's not only destroying jobs, but now we have new occupations. For example, uh, data science was something that probably 30 years ago wasn't a big word. Um, so what we're gonna do in this work is, uh, it's, it's very hard to predict which are the new occupations, the new emerging occupations. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume there's a labor reallocation. So those occupations that have a low automation probability are gonna increase their demand for labor, while those that have a high automation probability will decrease their demand for labor. So 
basically that's that's what I'm saying here, right? So automation reduces, in a way we can think of it as it reduces the number of hours it works, but we're gonna assume the total number of jobs remain constant. By the way, it, it's a known trend that we have reduced the amount of hours we work uh, in general. So if, if, if you put these assumptions, you can uh, easily compute that occupations are likely to be automated, uh, decrease their labor demand, and occupations are unlikely to be automated, increase their labor demand. So assume you have two occupations, one red that's likely to be automated, one blue that isn't. You have 100 workers and 80 workers. Well, after the reallocation, maybe you'll have a demand for 40 workers in one and 140 in total. So they will still sum 180, but just have a reallocation, right? So basically it's saying, well, maybe you want less, less taxi drivers and we want more data scientists. But in total, we'll... Um, we'll assume we want the same number of workers. Of course, one can play with that assumption, but that's uh, you know, that's something the model can take into account, but for the baseline, this is what we assume. Okay, so how do we model the labor market? Well, our system is a network and occupations uh, with, uh, and each occupation has employed or unemployed workers. So uh, em employed means you're employed at an occupation. Unemployed means uh, the agent was previously employed in that occupation and then switched to unemployed. And we have job vacancies, right? So we have three variables uh, per occupation at different time steps. Okay, and then what happens? Well, from the perspective of a worker, let's say you begin to time step employed in occupation I, then you ask, uh, you know, are, is the worker separated or fired? Um, and then you say yes, well, then you'll end the time step unemployed. If no, you end the time step employed and that's it. Now, what happens if you begin the time step unemployed? Well, you ask, did you submit an application at the previous time step? Yes. Was it successful? Uh, no, well, apply for another vacancy. If it was, uh, then you just realize, well, is it in the same occupation? Yes, you remain there. And no, maybe you switch occupation, right? So this is, this is the mechanism in which we can switch occupations. Um, and then another way is, well, if you didn't submit an application, then apply to a job vacancy, right? And then you repeat this. So basically workers, if they're unemployed, they apply for, uh, for work. If they're employed, uh, they don't have to. From the point of view of the vacancies, uh, it's even simpler. Once a vacancy is open and each time step you ask, did they receive any applicants? Yes, well, choose one at random, hire them, close the vacancies. No, well, end time step open and hope someone applies. At the, um, at the next time step. Okay, uh, so how do worker separation or firings and job openings work? Well, we assume there's two ways of doing it. The, there's two processes that go in between. One is a spontaneous process, right? The workers are sometimes fired with a probability delta U and vacancies are sometimes opened with a probability delta B. And this is independent of the occupation. You know, this might be like, well, you know, I, I'm moving to a new city, so I quit my job. Or, you know, the company is growing and we're just going to hire some worker. And this is just, you know, uniform and spontaneous. And then there's the labor demand reallocation. This one is a state defend, dependent process. And this one, what it's going to do is it's going to reallocate uh, demand. So what we're going to assume is that uh, workers uh, in let's in in occupations that are likely to be automated in red, uh, well those occupations are more likely to fire workers because they're transitioning. The let's say you know the board wants to, you know that they want to say okay we we need more data scientists so maybe we're going to open more occupations, uh, more vacancies in blue occupations, right? Uh, so this is a state dependent process and it depends on the particular occupation. And this is the process that will drive the labor reallocation. Basically, uh, what we mean is that occupations that are likely to be automated, uh, then you'll fire more workers. If you're unlikely to be automated, then you'll open more vacancies. Okay, uh, and we can translate this into equations. So one thing uh, we focused a lot on this work is the agent-based model, we modeled the agents and everything, but uh, when it comes to calibrating a model, it's very hard to do it if you don't, if you can't run it fast enough. So we also translated all the agent-based model into some approximate equations that we could run really fast, and then we could calibrate the model. Uh, this is how the equations look. Basically, uh, they're just, um, you know, you have a variable at t plus one, it's the variable, you know, the employed workers in occupation i at t plus one were the ones that were previously employed, minus the ones that are separated. Unemployed is plus the ones that are separated. Vacancies is plus the open vacancies. 
Okay, so this is, you know, talking about worker separation and job openings, but now, you know, how do we talk about how you switch occupations and how you uh, get employed, basically? So then we do a job matching, right? And uh, search and matching is a uh, literature that has been in economics for a while. Uh, Diamond Mortis and Epistardus uh, won the Nobel Prize for this. And what they assume is um, it's, it's not instantaneous that you have unemployed workers in vacancies and that you can immediately match. There are some what we call frictions, right? Uh, it takes time uh, and resources to you know, put a job vacancy. And as an unemployed worker, it also takes time for you to apply and get the job. But, and, and what we assume is basically a new uh, matching function that takes into account the network structure. So we assume unemployed workers apply to one job vacancy of a neighboring occupation. So that means that, you know, a, uh, I'm a mathematician, but I probably won't be able to apply uh, for a medical doctor position or, or a physicist. I don't know. I, I have many hats. But uh, the, the some transitions that I cannot do. Uh, and many workers also have this transition. So we take the occupational mobility network and introduce those frictions. Okay, so this is basically the equation. You look at how many vacancies a particular occupation has. You take into account the occupational mobility network, which says basically how likely is it to see a transition between the two, and you, and you uh, normalize this, and that gives you the probability that a worker from occupation I applies to a vacancy in J. Uh, sorry, I should say, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt. I'm more than happy to take uh, clarifying questions or others. Okay. So, okay, job matching. Okay, so now uh, workers send their uh, job applications to a different vacancies, and then vacancies to receive at least one application will hire a worker. And that's what we call the flow of workers. It depends on the unemployed, the vacancies, and uh, the occupational mobility network. Note that, you know, it may be that a vacancy does not receive a job application, uh, just because there are, you know, the, the vacancies in a position in the network where there's not many unemployed workers at the time. If there's a lot of growing demand, you'd actually expect that uh, there's a, there are scarce workers. Um, and, you know, this is something that could happen perhaps uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We felt like there were some occupations where we really needed like more doctors, for example, in hospitals, or uh, we needed uh, more help with deliveries. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not a given that all vacancies will get a, a match. Okay, so that completes the dynamic equations. So employed workers are the ones that were previously employed, minus the ones that were separated, plus the ones that are hired, right? And this is, uh, this is the flow of workers. They can be hired from your same occupation or from a different occupation. And then, you know, we of course have conservation between employed and unemployed. And then uh, vacancies, they're reduced when they hire workers, right? When, when they close, we remove that vacancy. Uh, and, and yeah, so this is basically this is how the model runs in uh, in the fast way. We also do the edge based model, and we make sure they match. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about the macroeconomic behavior and the calibration. And to do this, I'm going to talk about the beverage curve. So the beverage curve is a it's it's a well known uh, macroeconomic stylized fact. It's probably the most well known uh, fact in the uh, labor market. Which, and, and it says several things. One is uh, the average curve is the relationship between the vacancy rate and the unemployment rate. And this is a negative relationship. Basically, when you have many vacancies, you expect that you have few unemployed workers because, well, it's easy to find a job. There's, there's, there's a lot of demand for jobs. When you have a high unemployment rate, you have a low vacancy rate because, well, basically any vacancy that gets posted, it's, it's uh, soon taken by some, by some worker, right? Uh, and, okay, so that's the, the first stylized fact. You expect a negative relationship. The second is that, you know, this, this is a time-dependent curve. And during recession, it goes down. And in recoveries, it goes up. So here in yellow, we have uh, the 2009 uh, recession, the Great Recession, sorry. Um, and we see it went down. And then we have the recovery and it goes up. Um, and so that's the second fact. And then the third fact is that historically it has almost always cycled counterclockwise. So it goes down, it goes a bit up. And so, sorry, it goes down, it, um, it shifts a bit outwards the origin and then it goes up. 
uh, and this has happened for many recessions, and there's uh, there's some explanations, but it's still not well known why it always ha well why it almost always happens, uh, but it's it's known that it has a counterclockwise cyclicality. Okay, so how do we calibrate our model? We take the beverage curve and uh, we fit the parameters so that we fit this curve, and we're really happy to see that we have a, a decent fit and also that we're able to reproduce the counterclockwise cyclicality. Depending on how uh, on, on which parameters we use, uh, we have different cyclicality. Uh, and uh, we also believe our model, well, this is further work and we'd like to explore this, uh, but it's reproducing the cyclicality, which by the way is really important because it basically means that after a recession, it's harder for unemployed workers to find jobs, right? So you have the same number of vacancies, let's say 3%, but, you know, before, the, when you were going down in the recession, you had a 6% unemployment rate. And now for a 3% vacancy rate, you have an 8% unemployment rate. So it means that there's more frictions in the market that unemployed workers are finding it harder to get jobs. Okay, uh, so that's, that's how we calibrate the model, but let's, let's talk about automation, right? That's, that's the thing we're uh, interested in talking about today. So, uh, at the aggregate level, the first thing we do is uh, we put the shock. This is the what we call the target demand for uh, automation. And you see, for example, childcare workers, which were unlikely to be automated, go up. Farmer TADs, were, which are um, likely to be automated, go down in demand. Um, and then we have the unemployment rate and the long-term unemployment rate. Uh, we do this for the occupational mobility and for the complete network. The dashed lines are uh, our approximations, that's the equations, and the, the, the green actually squiggly lines are simulations. So we see that we have a good match. Uh, this is at the aggregate level. Okay, so one thing we see is that in a complete network, what we assume is that every occupation is linked with every other occupation. So that means um, a mathematician can become a doctor, a physicist can become an economist, a taxi driver can become a physicist, right? Uh, in the occupational mobility network, that's not very likely. We we look at the data and we see what transitions have actually happened. So it's uh, it, it's a good result. It's, it's like a good sanity check to know that, well, once you incorporate this labor market frictions, you expect a higher unemployment rate. You also expect um, uh, a higher... Sorry, is there a question? Um, you also expect the spike uh, when the automation shock hits to be larger for the occupational mobility network than for complete network. And we see the same thing for the long-term unemployment, which is actually what we want to focus most because uh, long-term unemployment tends to be really detrimental for workers. Uh, that's when they start losing skills. And well, once you're long-term unemployed, it's always more unlike, more, it's always less likely that you find work. Um, Maria, I'm sorry, could, yes. I, could I just ask a clarifying question on, sure. on this slide? So um, uh, 20, roughly 2018 uh, or so, 2017, you're um, instigating like a, a shock. Um, and is that somehow like the automation given by the Fry and Osborne number sort of turns on? And previously, um, you know, there was zero automation probability or how exactly does that shock work? Right. Uh, so before we had a steady state, the model fits the steady state. So what we do is we put the model in a steady state using uh, the employment data from 2016, which I think was the one we had. Um, and so we keep the model in the steady state and then we implement the automation shock. In the Frey and Osborne paper, they say the automation shocks uh, take between uh, 20 to 30 years. So we took uh, 30 years. Of course, mo most of the shock is you know, done mostly within a decade. But uh, since we're using sigmoid function, which is you know, in the literature of, uh, of uh, innovation, you see technology tends to be taken with sigmoids or S shapes. Uh, but yes, basically what we do is the gray line is the whole time. It's the 30 years of the automation period, uh, though most of it happens in 10 years. Uh, and this we did uh, based on you know, what Frey and Osborne reported. Uh, we also, in the supplementary material, we played a bit around with this and played, uh, you know, what if the automation actually happened in, you know, 20 years? And you see different, uh, of, of course, the exact results change a bit, but overall, the results are, are are the same in the sense that you see a spike maybe a bit higher or a bit lower, depending on how harsh the shock is. Uh, but yeah, that's, I think, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that's great. Thanks a lot. Okay, perfect. 
Um, okay, so so this is at the aggregate level, right? But you know, at the beginning, I talked about occupations and what's happening uh, with them. So here, I'm going to plot the unemployment rate. This does the percentage change and the long-term unemployment percentage change of different occupations. That's on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we plot the probability of computerization or probability or of automation. Uh, we color code occupations by their uh, wage. And we run the model for the complete network. That's where we have no labor market frictions and everyone can go anywhere. And when we use the occupational mobility network, which is a more realistic scenario. We see that for the complete network, the percentage increase in the unemployment rate only depends on the probability of automation, right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a line with no, um, no, uh, no variance in the horizontal axis. Now, when we include the occupational mobility network, we see variance. We see, for example, focus on occupations that have a 0.8 probability of, of computerization, the outcome is fairly different, right? We have, we have uh, heterogeneity. And this is explained by the network structure, right? Because it's the only thing we changed in the model. Uh, and, and we start seeing the effects I talked about at the beginning, right? So psychologists uh, are here, so they, they're unlikely to be automated and they decrease the employment rate, but childcare workers and electricians actually increase their long-term unemployment rate. Uh, and this is due to second order effects that I, I'm gonna talk a bit more later. Um, and well, we see, for example, statistical assistants and pharmacy ADs, they're likely to be automated, but this occupation are close to healthcare and maybe uh, computer science, which, um, which, are, which are sectors that are growing in demand. So even if they're automated, they can transition to other occupations. And then of course we see uh, you know, taxi drivers, roofer, tire builders, which are likely to suffer from automation. Um, yeah. Okay, and we color coded uh, the occupations by their median wage. Uh, darker colors are lower wage, uh, brighter colors are higher wage. We tend to see a relationship. When you see low automation probability, um, the dots tend to be lighter colored, so they are high wage. And when they're, uh, when they're high automation probability, they're low wage. But so, so this is, you know, this is, this is how the automation shock is assumed. But then we thought about, well, maybe the network structure is actually a good idea. It is, it's, it's good or bad, right? Maybe they're giving more opportunities to the low work, to the low wage occupa occupations uh, to transition. Uh, so what we did to measure this network effect, we take the difference between uh, the let's say blue dot and the orange dot, and that would give you uh, a baseline to compare, right? Like when we put the occupational mobility network and when we put no network frictions, what's the effect? So we take that difference and we plot it against wage. So here you have the network effects on unemployment and long-term unemployment, which is, as I said, the difference between the blue dots and the orange dots in the previous slide. Uh, so if it's positive, it means the network uh, is. It means that the network effect, the, the network effects are more likely to increase the unemployment rates uh, on those occupations. So it's it's uh, it's an adverse effect. It's it's not it's not something you'd want. And what we see is that uh, well. First of all, most occupations are above zero. So it means in general, the occupational mobility network is including more frictions, which makes sense, right? Because we're, we're explicitly adding frictions. But it, it also shows a negative relationship, which means that if you have a low wage, you're much more likely to be uh, on top. Well, for example, uh, occupations with high median wage, they're almost always below. So th this is a red line. This is already showing us um, that if we thought that occupational mobility and the network effects would sort of uh, help reduce the inequality that automation might cause, well, our results suggest that's uh, not a very hopeful idea. So we might want to look more into uh, other policies. Um, um, sorry, just a, a second uh, clarifying question, if, if I may. Sorry if I um, missed this from, from before. How exactly um, is the rates of vacancies determined? So, I mean, how do you know um, in, your, in your model, where does the sort of um, rate of, of um, yeah, vacancies or the change in demand for certain jobs, how is that parameterized? Right. Great. No, that's a great question. I'm sorry I, I didn't mention it before. So we use what we uh, call the target demand, 
right? Uh, and this is saying basically if you're going to increase the demand or decrease the demand. Now, demand is employment plus vacancies. That's, you know, the demand of a particular occupation is how many workers they have employed plus how many workers they have, they, they would want, which is the vacancies. And, okay, so I'm going to go back a bit to the equations. And the thing is, I didn't uh, go into the details of how this spontaneous process worked, but what we basically do is we take the difference between the current demand, so that this is uh, employment plus vacancies, and the target demand. So we would see that if the current demand is um, lower, sorry, it's, 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 it's higher than the target demand, it means that you have more workers or more demand in that occupation that you would like to have, and then you're going to separate workers. Now, if if you look at this here in the vacancies, it's on the other way around. If your target demand is higher than your realized demand, then it means you would want more workers, so you open vacancies. So um, the way the mechanism the model works is the spontaneous process just you know hires and fires some workers, which is this term here, and then the reallocation effect is done on this part. We put the target demand as an external factor, which is the automation shock or the COVID shock, or for the beverage curve, we use a sine wave. So this is the parameter that's sort of driving it. And yeah, that's how employment and vacancies are open. Um, does that answer or would you want me to go more into the details? No, that's great for now. Thanks so much. Okay, great. And, and uh, thanks so much for the questions. Please uh, stop me again if there's anything that's not uh, being clear. Okay. So yeah, so this is, for example, childcare workers, you'd expect more vacancies to open. And for pharmacy ADs, you'd expect them to be fired more often. Uh, but then, you know, the, the term that's playing a lot is the flow of workers, which depends on the network. And that's why you can have, uh, you know, uh, childcare workers increasing their long-term employment, while pharmacy increase, uh, ADs are decreasing it. Uh, and yeah, so uh, just to recap, uh, network effects are more likely to increase the unemployment rates of low-wage occupations. This is, you know, uh, shedding some uh, red lights and it's something we'd like to um, think more about. Okay, but now, you know, what's what's driving this behavior? I just want to take some example of how some occupations behave. So here, this is the unemployment rate of particular occupations. This is the sales representatives. Uh, they're likely to be automated. So you expect, you know, they have some unemployment rate, they peak and then they go down, right? Because um, uh, because of the automation shock, they're they're being fired more often. You look at lawyers; they have a low automation probability, means they're more likely to open vacancies. So there's a steady state. Uh, you open more vacancies, and they start decreasing their unemployment rate because it's 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 easier to get a job as a lawyer, and they reach the new steady state. Electricians, they're unlikely to be automated, so they start at the steady state. More vacancies open; they decrease their long-term unemployment. But uh, then you start seeing the second order effects, right? Because electricians are surrounded by occupations uh, that, uh, that are likely to be automated. And then they might start transition and applying for electrician jobs. So it's harder for electricians that were, uh, that were unemployed to get another job. And you see this peak, right? So this is what we call the second order network effects. And this is something you, cannot, you can't only see by the automation probability but you need to, to take into account the network structure. Okay, so talking about the network structure, um, you know, can we have some impact on this? Is there a way to, to break these frictions? So the first thing we did is some randomizations of the network structure. We can do some edge rewiring and weight reshuffling. Uh, this is a bit of preliminary work. Um, basically what happens, the edge rewiring doesn't uh, break the clustering as much as the weight reshuffling because of how the occupational mobility network uh, is made. Uh, well, basically it's, it's very dense, but the weights are very, um, change a lot. There's a lot of heterogeneity in the weight. But what, when we reshuffle them, basically what we're doing is breaking clusters, right? And then this decreases a lot uh, unemployment rate and long-term unemployment rate and also the spikes. So this is saying, well, yeah, maybe what's, what's causing all these problems are the, the frictions, right? And of course you expect this, this reshuffling to be somewhere in between the occupational mobility network, which is quite clusters and it has a lot of bottlenecks and the uh, complete network where everyone can go anywhere. Okay, uh, but then, you know, let's look at particular occupations. So here we have 
the unemployment rate percentage increased when we use the occupational mobility network and when we compare it to the edge rewiring or the weight reshuffling. And what we see is that the slope is lower than the identity line, meaning that uh, on average, that in general, um, uh, the unemployment rate increases less in the uh, reshuffling of the networks, right? Um, and this is particularly striking for long-term unemployment. So in a way, breaking this cluster structure helps us break all those frictions. Okay, that makes sense, but you know, I can't tell a policymaker, oh, you know, you just need to rewire the occupational mobility network. Just have you know, every anyone transition randomly anywhere. That's just not going to happen. Um, so what we thought is, well, maybe let's let's model some retraining effects, and we based this work on previous work we did uh, with uh, Penny, where we looked at uh, the work activities. We looked at ONET data uh, from work activities. And we found that uh, work activities are the best prediction of occupational transitions. So based on that, uh, we look at that network, which, which we call the job space. And if two occupations shared enough work activities, we said, well, maybe you know you could you could think of a retraining scheme and add some edges. So we added some edges. We did this, uh, you know, in a way that was uh, retraining only the susceptible, and another way which you know was just retraining in general. Uh, and we found that that actually both work. Uh, this is a bit preliminary, and uh, at the aggregate level, there's there's other roles that play into account, which is um, you know the employment of each occupation. So I'm not going to get into the details, but the basic idea is if you introduce some rewiring, you ca sorry if you introduce some retraining, which is adding edges, you can have an impact and uh, reduce the adverse effects of long-term unemployment and unemployment. Uh, we can see that at the occupation level, and in particular for long-term unemployment, you see, you know, this is the original occupational mobility network. This is the retraining one. And for the occupations which we targeted, which were the ones with um, high long-term unemployment change, you see that, uh, you know, it, it's below the identity line. So we're able to reduce uh, the long-term unemployment that was caused by automation for those, um, for those occupations. Okay. Uh, so I'm just uh, briefly going to talk about, I I guess I miscalculated a bit of time, so I would have more time, but uh, let's talk a bit about further work. Uh, as Alex said, we recently did work on the COVID pandemic, uh, and we had initial uh, shocks. And we said, well, you know, who's able to work in this pandemic? We looked at industries and occupations. For industries, uh, we look at those that were essential and non-essential. We based this on um, so this was early work. This was back in April. Um, and uh, there was this Italian list that classified occupations into uh, essential and non-essential, which could open or not. So we could map that to the U.S. And we also, for occupations, we had work activities. And we could uh, say if they could be done remotely or not. So we made a remote labor index for occupations and an essential index for industries. We also have uh, information of which industries employ which occupations. So with that information, we could say, well, you know, the people that cannot work are those that don't have an essential job and cannot work remotely. So for example, uh, uh, restaurants and, and, um, and pops, for example. And then that was on the supply side. And then we also took the demand side, right? Because even, you know, and, and this is something that in a sense, the supply side shocks uh, uh, were more, were harsher and stronger at the beginning, but they were shorter. The demand effects are still ongoing. So now we see, well, now it's a second lockdown, but you know, let's say two months ago, uh, pubs and restaurants were still open, but people wouldn't go as much, especially uh, uh, rich and elderly people wouldn't go as much because, well, they were scared of the virus. So uh, we took that into account and uh, we came up with uh, labor shocks. So here it's, um, this translates into when it's negative, it's the percentage of workers that cannot work due to because they're either uh, not essential, can't work remotely, or because there's no demand for them. And we had some positive shocks uh, due to uh, an increase in healthcare that was predicted by the Congress uh, Budget Office for an influenza pandemic. Uh, we can talk about if this really played out or not, but this were um, the first, you know, this was done back in April. So it was, there was, this were really more uh, predictions. Um, okay, so what do we see? We have cooks and restaurants, for example. They have a um, 
a, a quite negative shock, right? So they're unlikely to be able to work. Same for dishwashers, uh, rock splitters. And we plot this for wage. The first striking thing is that occupations with high wage, you almost never see any high, tra- high wage occupation with a strong labor shock. Uh, perhaps airline pilots, which makes sense. Uh, you know, even, even air, transport is considered essential, but you know, you see a huge demand because people are not traveling. So okay, that's that's the one occupation with high wage that was unlucky in this pandemic. But we have a lot of low wage occupations with a very strong shock. But then you can say, well, but okay, we also have several low wage occupations that have a small shock or even positive shocks. So you can talk about you know home health ADs, personal care ADs, janitors, uh, maids and house cleaners. But we now color code those occupations by the exposure to infection, as uh, said by Onet. This is not necessarily linked to COVID. This was done pre-COVID, but it also tells, you know, some, uh, it gives some idea of how exposed you could be to COVID. And what we see is that, okay, those low wage occupations, um, which don't have a a huge shock, they tend to be lightly colored. So what this is saying is like, when you have a low wage, you're either unlikely to be able to work, or when you're actually able to work, you might be exposed to the virus a lot more than someone with a high wage. So again, this is uh, this is talking about in in a way, you know, the hairs of this pandemic have been have been the people that have still been working, uh, and they're still uh, in low wage occupation. So it's 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 another thing that sheds light into this. Uh, what we would like to do, um, and this is something we had not had time because well, we've we we've, we've done some studies more on like supply chain analysis and industries, but something we're really curious about is incorporating these shocks into our model and understanding how occupation mobility plays out. Uh, because in the same way that the automation shock, you know, they affect some occupations, but you might have this transition in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there are some occupations that are experiencing a, an increase in demand. And what we really would like to have is, is, is a flow of workers from the occupations that cannot work to those that are needed the most, uh, both to uh, be able to address the pandemic better and also to uh, decrease unemployment and long-term unemployment. Okay, Uh, we also want to improve the model. We're working on this to implement wage dynamic, job-to-job transition, multiple applications, uh, add more skills, link this a bit more to work we did on the job space, uh, memory effects, career paths, right? Uh, And this is something, uh, and another thing I'd like to say is uh, we're also very interested in how cities are developed. And I know there's uh, also very good work uh, done here about that. So I'd be keen to talk a lot more uh, about that as well. There's also the beverage curve, as I said, uh, there's, um, there's the cyclicality that says after recessions, we usually cycle counterclockwise. But we also found out that depending on the parameters, you could have the beverage curve cycled the other way around. And the way this is important is because the way the beverage curve cycles tells you if it's going to be harder to get people employed after a recession. And if you, we could get it to switch the other way around, well, we would be... Uh, it would be a huge, uh, a huge victory uh, for a lot of people. Um, so, okay, I'm, I'm just going to conclude now. I'm going to say, you know, the main, the main um, message of this work is that the network structure plays an important role. We can't just ignore it. Uh, that automation can cause bottlenecks, and some workers will, will stay stuck for long periods of time. Uh, I do have to say, it's not, you know, I don't. Automation is not necessarily a bad thing. It's something that has happened before and it creates new jobs. And that's great. You know, that's what we really want is we want to stop jobs that are that can be automated because why would you do something if a robot can do it? But what we want to do is a smooth transition, right? Uh, we sort of want to remove this versions for the network and see how we can do it in a way that uh, there's, there's no so much winners and losers, but more winners in this transition. And yeah, and retraining schemes seem to be a good way to reduce unemployment. Uh, with all that, I'll just say uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, coming. Uh, I know it's 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 been a tough year, so I'm just sending everyone a remote hug, and I'm more than happy to take questions. And this are the reference of uh, most of the work I presented here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, this was great. Um, we're all a bit starved of uh, intellectual stimulation, so I really appreciate. Uh, that we were able to um, to set up this opportunity to to have the seminar at least remotely. 
Uh, so I will open the floor to questions. Please, if you have a question, um, just unmute yourself and go ahead. Maybe um, maybe make a, a quick uh, introduction um, in each case. I'm happy to start. Hi, this is Iyad. I'm the director of the center. And uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for presenting this really fascinating work. Um, that I think really pushes the boundary. I was I had a high level question, which is about um, how economists are to the work that you're doing. I've um, in part because it's uh, simulation based, and I know that uh, typically economists like to do, you know, um, models to work with models that they can solve analytically, and then uh, have some kind of linear prediction that they would then test in in the data. Um, it's a little bit uncharacteristic of, of them to be open to this type of work. So uh, have you had uh, pushback um, or maybe the apathy or have they actually taken uh, on board some of these suggestions? And I'm speaking from experience talking to some of these economists before that seem that, that, that have those types of skepticisms. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's a really good one. I'd say it's mix. Uh, it's, uh, to be honest, the most, I, I think this work is a lot more accepted in complex systems type of scenario, more of a networks approach where we're used to, you know, it's, you know, having some master equations, it's, it's, it's sort of the standard. Uh, for economists, we do have some pushbacks. Now, I do think the reason we're able, you know, we've, we've been working with some economists as well, for example, this international labor organization and others, and the reason we're able uh, to connect them with them a bit more is because we, I believe, have made at least some job and I'd say a decent job at serving the previous literature. So one of the things is saying, for example, uh, and, you know, if I was giving this talk to economics, I would change it a little bit. I would talk more about the matching function, how what we're doing is just doing a different search and matching function. Uh, we also talk a lot about the beverage curve, which is something that's very important to them. Uh, so there is certainly a pushback. I wouldn't, and, you know, in, in a way, on a part of the paper, what we do is for a very simple, complete network, we can solve the model a bit more and just sort of relate to those equations, which is usually the more economics approach. Uh, so as I said, it's it's mixed. There's, there's also a push, I believe, for economics to start using more data and that part they like. Uh, economists are also very open to networks. I think they're also liking that. Uh, the dynamics and out of equilibrium is still, it might not be their cup of tea, but I think once we're able to translate it into uh, more of the language and the previous literature, then they are a bit more open. Great. Good luck to all of us. <laughs> Thank you. And and yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan of, of the work the, uh, at the Institute, so I'm very happy to see you too. Thank you. Hello, Maria. This is Jason from State Dreamer. I'm a poet and fellow physicist with some experience in the uh, Thank you very much. Um, I want to maybe figure out the presentation. Uh, 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 pin um, uh, towards me. It's some uh, the model can tell you something about is there also a future direction for for the model uh, sorry i wasn't able to hear well you said is their model able to uh is there is there any hint to towards pinpoint the um some behavior which could be the emergence of new jobs or is there oh. yeah that's what right that's, uh, is there, or is this a future direction and right yes so it is a feature direction we think of going. Uh, the model, the way it works, uh, since we want to fix variables and the variables depend on the number of occupations, uh, we sort of need to have the number of occupations fixed. Uh, in a way, modeling the emergence of new occupations would mean we have a dynamic network, a network where nodes you know, start popping up and others die out, right? Um, so at the moment, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, that would be like an external shock that we would model. There is a way of doing it, which basically means you start you initialize 
the occupations and you have zero demand for them at the beginning and then you increase the demand. So there is a way to consider that. Now, if you're looking more for the emergence of new occupations, I would focus on the work of uh, Lynn, I believe. What they do is they look at the classification system of occupations and they see where uh, there has been, uh, I believe it's reclassifications and where new, so, you know, the classification system changes and then new occupations emerge. And they're able to map out in a way uh, which, in which, in a way of saying it, it was part of the network, though they don't use networks in their work, uh, you see a higher emergence of reclassification. So I think that's the closest work there is to new occupations emerging. Uh, but I'd be very curious if you know of other literature, because I think, you know, that's that, that's one of the things we, we would really like to focus oh, on. Completely ignorant. That's why I'm asking. Thank you very much for the work. Thank you. Uh, hi, Maria. Uh, this is Ino, and yeah, I'm a postdoc working with Alex, and yeah, we talked uh, before by email. <laughs> yeah, so I have a question. Uh, oh, first of all, great. Thanks for the great talk, and yeah, I have a question about the retraining. So, uh, I'm wondering uh, if you could explain more about the how you model the the the, the retraining in your work, and also uh, if you have any uh, guess about the optimal strategy about the, 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 the retraining the skills yeah on the on the skill networks right uh, so the way we do the retraining is first um, first we you know perhaps the best retraining you could think of is getting low automation probabilities to high automation probabilities immediately right but that's yeah. unrealistic it's unlikely that we're able mm -hmm. to you know show someone how to program in python in even a year, like it's it, it's difficult to do that. So the first thing we do is we think, well, what are the edges that you would be able to to add? So we go to this uh, job space paper uh, where we have this network of possible transitions, and we select those edges that have, uh, I believe it's which the weight is higher than the average, or two times the average, and. Um, and that's like, you know, th that's what we consider our possible edges for adding. And then what we did is first we linked those with low, um, with an increasing long-term unemployment with those that didn't. Uh, so that was the strategy. Then we tried a random strategy where we just add some edges within this possible edges, we add them around. And we saw very similar effects, which we think is uh, the second order effects playing around. Now, I'd say this is a bit preliminary. It's, it's something we want to look more into because one important thing is to focus on the employment of occupations because one thing is adding an edge, but we must consider that the cost depends on the number of people you have in that occupation, right? Because you're going to have to spend some money in the retraining. Um, yeah. So it's it's not something we have looked that much into, uh, but I, I'm, you know, that's, that's of the future path to go and I'd love to talk more about it because it's, uh, definitely, you know, and one thing one can think of an algorithm to just iterate around, uh, and then you have, you know, your cost function is you have a certain budget for retraining. Sorry, that's sorry, that's your uh, constraint, and your cost function is uh, the long term unemployment of occupations. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. this uh, topic is super interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. No, oh, thank you for your question. Uh, just one one more from me i'm um my question is about the beverage curve um and yeah i guess since there's so many physicists here uh, <laughs> i have to just point out this you know how much this resembles like a hysteresis loop and and this this area is like sort of dis wasted energy sort of dis you know um sort of a negative quantity, a quantity that has negative, uh, negative implications and something that you want to minimize. And what, I, what I'm interested in, um, interested in thinking about is, I mean, most of that friction is, is just due to sort of, um, how long it takes to hire someone or how long it takes to fire someone in, in normal times, I would imagine. Um, but there's been a, like a lot of discussion around, um, the, the sort of secondary effects of, of COVID, um, that, it's an event that that does what's called automation forcing. So it kind of it's a it's a moment to sort of reset somehow how how workplaces work and how um, jobs are sort of set up, with the effect that a lot of new technologies suddenly 
become more developed or more more kind of adopted um so yeah I, I guess i was just wondering you know have you thought um do you know or like have you thoughts at all about how the beverage curve might look different um in light of the covid um the covid shock yeah that's that's a great question um i, I if it's cycling clockwise or anti-clockwise i think we're probably able to get to start to get some data soon um the the thing about the hysteresis i i totally agree what i saw i was like i was so tempted to you know just go in that way but i think it's important to start interpreting this more in economic terms as well um so you know in the same way in history as you talk about a loss of energy about this friction then it's it's important to think like uh you know what does this gap mean it might be as you say that it's um so this there's several theories about the beverage curve one of them for example is well, maybe you, when you have to fire people, you fire low-skill workers first. And then low-skill workers find it harder to find jobs uh, in the recovery. So that's why you have this, this gap. Uh, that might be it. It is true that COVID is, a, in, a, in a way, it's, it's an experiment of what has happened. And we're going to see... Okay, and, and one of the other explanations is structural change, Right. In a recession, you fired those workers that you were sort of going to maybe fire anyway because you were already going to automate them. And in the recovery, well, you're not going to hire them again because you've already replaced them with a robot. Uh, and that's something, that's one of the theories that I think we could really test with the COVID pandemic because I do think uh, a lot of the workers that are being fired or, or separated at the moment uh, might be replaced by automation. And then when we go back into the recovery, they're not going to be able to get back into the same place. Uh, so, yes, I mean, I, I think COVID is, is a very unfortunate. It is a natural experiment that will allow to test uh, many things. And as you say, this is, this is a great opportunity to start testing that. Um, I, I do have to say there's, there's other theories about why it cycles that way. Uh, but I, I actually, I, I, I have a feeling this might be the one you said it might be a, uh, I'd be one of the the strong candidates for explaining it. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm in, I'm uh, interested to see when all the sort of macro economic data starts to come in, um, and we can kind of see what the what the long term effect is. I mean, my guess is it's it's kind of like a wartime scenario in some sense. You have like a huge increase in um, in demand on in some areas and a huge decrease in demand in in others um but uh but yeah um let's let's wait and see and uh, my my second question is um just to ask if you'd kind of started to think about your results in terms of skills because uh or uh, i guess uh, you know workplace tasks um to use the the right jargon my my guess is that um that some of this is going to be driven by um is going to be driven by by uh by by tasks and the automation of tasks because you sort of want you want jobs that um, you know if a job has a high probability of automation you want it to be sort of well connected to other jobs so there's a possibility to um, to transition easily away from the job that job but you also want those other jobs to be kind of not, not too similar like some somehow dissimilar um, so that they're not also susceptible so it seems like a sort of a bit of a Goldilocks uh, Goldilocks scenario where you want sort of a lot of jobs that are close but not too close. Um, and my, my guess is that the skills would be kind of the thing driving that underneath. So I, I was just wondering if you'd kind of thought about that or uh, or looked at that at all. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. You sort of enough overlap that you can transition and not enough so that it's the same job and they're both automated. Uh, yes, we've been thinking about that, which is uh, why we are. So there's this debate if it's task, skills, knowledge, uh, work activities. Those are at least some of the things ONET has in their data. Uh, the thing we found is that work activities tend to uh, predict more uh, job transitions. So we might think those are the best way when you think about this overlap. Uh, that might be the, the good variable to focus on. It might be true that, you know, why not use all of them and maybe some sort of combination. Uh, but yes, I think on a sort of meta analysis, you know, we have the network of occupations. But then you look at the composition of each occupation and you have a different network when it's where it says sort of the similarity between occupations that are not exactly true, which is not, you know, not because a worker transition between two occupations, it's the exact measure of similarity. 
there's sort of there's other factors which include wage, which include demand, etc. Uh, so in a different level, you have this uh, network of different occupations and how they relate. And those links can be determined, as you said, by tasks, by the overlap that we we're talking about, that you want them to overlap enough, but not too much. Uh, yeah, so I think I think that's a way to go for sure. And it's, you know, there's, there's so many open questions that I'm very happy a lot of people are working on this because uh, I think, you know, it's it's the type of thing we need a uh, question. Uh, we need quick answers and we couldn't have more people work on it, working on this. So, yeah. Yeah, totally agreed. Thanks so much. Thank you. All. Yeah, I, I think we have time for uh, one more question, if there is one more from uh, anyone in the audience. And uh, if there are no more questions, then we can all uh, go and enjoy our uh, extra two minutes. Um, so all that's left to be done is to say thank you very much again uh, to Maria. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, thanks for everyone for attending and, and your thoughtful questions. Great. Uh, thank you all very much for coming and thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to interacting with this group more. Uh, and you know, when I'll be doing this fellowship, I hope to have flexibility and I'd love to collaborate with this group further. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank have you. a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye.